have the opportunity here to discuss about uh, uh, certain markets, uh, the outlook on certain markets, with uh, Mr. David Clark, who obviously represents one of the uh, leading international trading houses in the world. Uh, they, um, they are located in one of the uh, major growth areas of the steel industry, uh, and uh, probably one of the uh, 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 highest growing uh, regions. And Mr. David Dilber, uh, representing the Turkish Steel Exporters Association, uh, will uh, share uh, information with us on the Turkish steel industry, their exports. As you know, Turkey's uh, steel industry has been. Mr. Bakhtin, I'd like to start uh, asking the first question to you. We know that uh, governments are uh, increasingly restricting raw material exports while raising uh, trade barriers against uh, imports has become uh, common for the sake of self-sufficiency. Uh, a lot of countries are uh, acting in this, in this matter. In the meantime, uh, companies are seeking more vertical integration for the same reason. Uh, do, you think, uh, do you think trade is becoming old-fashioned? Well, uh, difficult question. Trade, by definition, can't be old-fashioned. Cross-border trade can be replaced by uh, intra-country trade. Intercontinental trade can replace inter-regional trade. So trade will continue. The very basis of what we do is trading. When you make a rebar, you don't make it just to hold on to it or to look at it. You make it to sell to somebody else to, to if you like, make money. You monetize the product. And at the moment, despite what our governments have done with the euro and the dollar, we trade in exchange for a medium of exchange we call money. So trade will continue. Trade will change, though. And trade is a function of the environment within which it exists. That means if, for instance, Turkey was to ban the export of rebar, people would have to buy their rebar from somewhere else, but they would still buy rebar. That would mean that trade changed. You would get production of rebar in other places and import from other places. So we're in a continually evolving world. But when I came back from Asia, I think 12 years ago, to take over our main trading company in the UK, I was told that international trade in this is dead. I was told consolidation is coming. Well, I've been in the steel business now 31 years. I must sometimes say, you know, it's not always been easy. I'm sure there are easier careers, easier industries. But I was, I've always been told that the, the, the industry is dying, the trade is dying, and it's not true. There is less consolidation, more trade, more cross-border trade, more exchange of steel goods than there ever has been, and there must be because there's a growing steel production. It'll get changed by people banning this, promoting that, putting duties on this, and you get, one thing you do get in trading is you get nonsenses, you get inefficiencies created by the uh, involvement of government. We had overproduction, un underlying overproduction for years because of government subsidies. We get Debar produced in countries where it would be more sensible to import debar. Why? Because they say you can import billet, but you can't import debar because of that value. So no trade is not dead. Trade will change, but it will continue at least as long as you live, and probably as long as I am. <laughs> You're a bit older. Than me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, so, Mr. Alatsari, uh, significantly uh, for the last decade or so. And uh, it is expected to grow uh, significantly on the back of rising demand from the uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. Uh, in particular, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar uh, are expected to generate the bulk of the demand in the region. Uh, from which sectors do you think the demand for steel will come? Uh, in my point of view, actually, uh, that you know the uh, Gulf areas of uh, some countries actually in the past they have been concentrating on setting up their heavy industries and there was no much concentration in setting up like uh, housing projects or even sometimes even the uh, infrastructure projects and now by having a big ratio of young uh, population of uh, citizens who, who require like housing and require and also because the population is increasing that the infrastructure is not helping now so that Expansion is needed. Uh, mostly, uh, like uh, 
Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Qatar. You see that the governments have presently signed a lot of budget for the infrastructure and for the housing uh, projects. Uh, plus also Kuwait actually, uh, which has been suffering for a long time because of the parliament freezing some of their projects. And this created like a you know, kind of a little delay. So these three countries, we can say that uh, mainly are booming. Uh, I think Kuwait has uh, recently their demand increased by about 26%. And uh, while in Qatar it was stable during uh, 2010 and 2011, but we expect some more improvement also during 2012 and onwards. Uh, because of the, uh, as you know, the Qatar has been awarded the uh, World Cup 2022. And uh, there are a lot of projects which are also on the pipeline to come. We are waiting also the new budget to be announced beginning of May, in which it will uh, show more details on those projects. And currently also there are a lot of projects which are under construction in Qatar. One of them is the main, uh, like one of the main projects, which is uh, the new uh, port, seaport. Uh, uh, last uh, uh, 2011 actually showed that you know, there was some decline in some markets, but there was improvement in some other markets. You actually shown uh, like a decline of 10% in demand due to the freezing of some of projects uh, from uh, the government, especially from Abu Dhabi. Uh, and as you know, that Dubai is still suffering maybe uh, of the crisis in 2008, and Dubai had. Uh, mostly like finished with this infrastructure and project. Uh, Bahrain also, because the political uncertainty, this was also like, you know, created kind of uh, shrinking in the demand by about 15%. But last year in general, actually, the GCC have, uh, countries have shown uh, an increase of 3% in general. Thank you very much. Uh, how many stadiums are uh, uh, how many stadiums are going to be built for the World Cup? Uh, in Qatar, I think what is needed for the World Cup is 12, 12. but uh, the three of these are like uh, going to be, uh, of the current ones which we have, are going to be uh, renovated. And the new, uh, I think nine new stadiums are going to be built. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dilbert, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Turkish steel industry has been growing uh, almost constantly during the past decade, except for uh, after the crisis, obviously, in 2009, uh, when, uh, when the <coughs> Turkish industry felt the impact of the crisis. Uh, the uh, Turkey's uh, annual crude steel production has reached 34 million tons in 2011, and the uh, consumption is growing closer to 30 million tons, right? Uh, what can you tell us about the bulk product side? Uh, how have the country's rebar and uh, wild rock production capacities uh, changed during this period? And uh, what is the forecast up to 2015? Uh, also, what, what's the domestic demand projection uh, for Turkey, uh, particularly taking into consideration the strong performance of the construction industry in the country? I think it would be very surprising if I continue with the speech of Mr. Dave Factor. I can say that Turkey may ban uh, Libar exports, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the case. Uh, Turkish Libar uh, production increased. I will give you some figures about this. You know, uh, at the beginning of the uh, 2000s, Turkish Libar uh, production was only uh, 5 million tons, and uh, it reached uh, this year, uh, it uh, past uh, 13 million tons of Libar production this year. And uh, <coughs> I will give you some figures about the, our prospects. What will happen uh, for long products, totally, in, uh, this year we expect to make production of 25 uh, million tons of long products. And uh, it will make some, totally, total quit production will be 38 million tons, which was, as Mr. Moat said, 34 million tons in uh, 2011. It will be uh, 4 million tons of increasing production this year, we expect. 
and uh, we expect the increase to be uh, 41 million tons for next year and it will be 43.5 million tons in the year 2014 and it will continue in this way and also the capacity utilization rate also is increasing it shows the high demand the consumption of, of, of course in the export markets are extremely good uh, this year the capacity utilization we expect to be 79.8 percent of capacity utilization and uh, it was uh, 78 percent last year and we hope to be uh, the capacity utilization in 2015, it will be 84 point percent. And uh, for uh, uh, for the consumption side, I'd like to give you some figures also. Uh, as you said, it's uh, something like 30 million tons of consumption we have, and uh, we expect it to be uh, this year. Uh, the total consumption will be 30.5 million tons and uh, next year we expect it to be 32 million tons and it will continue from next year uh, some 7 to 8 percent per year and it's due to the uh, high uh, construction demand in Turkey and uh, as explained in, the, in all meetings today also uh, <coughs> The uh, DIBAB, I would like to give you some figures also for uh, DIBAS, which will be, we hope that uh, this year, the, uh, next year, the DIBAB production will reach 14 million tons in 2013. The total DIBAB production in Turkey will reach 14 million tons. And they expect it to be more than uh, 15.2 million tons in the year 2015. Today is how to be called on. And therefore, steel mills, instead of this, we only touched on it this morning, instead of a steel mill saying, look, I can leave one and make another 100,000 tons. No, you think how you're going to sell that 100,000 tons at a, at a profit. So you, you sent me in advance some questions that you've been asking. It said, when will the boom times come back? <laughs> now China goes as long as steel. Uh, so, shall we go back to your question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, household prices in, uh, in China and uh, the like, likely domestic rebalancing of the economy, uh, which means uh, shift towards less investment and more consumption. Uh, there might be a significant drop in Chinese steel demand in the medium term. Um, and, uh, the Chinese government would like to see some rationalization in the steel industry anyway, with those mills which are not uh, efficient closing down and some consolidation. I think that they will try to promote that. <laughs> Just for that, I'm going to ask you a question, David. I might not answer. Okay. <laughs> you made a very interesting comment with your first answer to Baran. Under the definition of money, what is the definition of money in you? to the quantitative easing and some of the debasement which is going on. We're seeing the dollar hegemony kind of being changed at this point in the world. We're seeing bilateral agreements for oil for gold or you know cross currencies, Australian dollar for Chinese yuan. What, if anything, are you and STEMCOR doing to mitigate any of that or to foresee what you might do as far as trade in the future, more barter deals. Can you elaborate on your thoughts about monetary policy and what Stanford is doing? Yeah, I mean, we're aware of the issues. We're aware of the debasement of money. And, but despite that apparent debasement, it's hard to imagine anything to replace it. I mean, I tried to build a barter deal with my wife, and she said that her maze wouldn't take a ton of steel for uh, a handbag she wanted to buy. Uh, very unreasonable, I thought, at the time. But uh, we, we haven't got a replacement. Um, whether people will... You know, people tried replacements. There was always the, 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 the ruble clearing. Some people have suggested there's going to be like a rupee clearing with Iran so that the oil can be traded. But what's funny is that people... 2009, 2010, everybody was talking about the end of the dollar. 
must tell you, the dollar has come back as the currency of price. There was a time, I would say, in 2007, 2008, where the euro was gaining some traction as an alternative valuer of the, the, the exchange. But that went by the board with the problems that we had in 2010, 2011. However, the euro is still accepted as the medium of exchange within Europe. And that we thought might have happened. That we thought that there was an Italian long products uh, fellow who said, look, I'm selling to you in euros in September, but you'll have to pay a new lira in, in December. But uh, it didn't come about. And even then, the euro's come back a bit. And what you said this morning, that you had to look at the two currencies. What we have seen in scrap, for instance, is that if you get a 3% reduction in, in the value of the euro, the price uh, in uh, Turkey for scrap tends to go down a little bit. Why? Because with the weakness of the long product in Europe, European scrap has become one of the determinants.